this is a really fascinating, fascinating uh, talk um, in the sense that as, you know, as, as a software consultant, engine software consultancy, um, myself, I've been doing this for quite a number of years now, and it's not often that you come across sort of projects which are sort of interesting from a technical point of view, but actually also interesting from a domain point of view, something that has sort of a real sort of social and environmental impact. Uh, and this is actually one of those, one of the sort of examples here, which I, you know, I think you, you find rarely, um, as I say, in, in, in sort of software consulting. So really, really excited to talk about this with you today. So what are we going to learn? Um, first of all, what, what, why, what do we mean by illegal phishing? What is the actual problem we're trying to solve? Um, we're also then going to move on to talking about commodity computing and, and in sort of our opinion, why we believe that not all serverless offerings are equal. Uh, we're then going to talk about an approach for building low-cost planetary scale solutions. Uh, and the approach is really quite important in terms of how we solve this problem. Um, there's a sort of tagline at the beginning about, you know, processing billions of, of data points for £10 a month. Um, so the approach was really what enabled us to do this. I'll then hand over to Carmel, who will help talk you through building um, a proximity detection pipeline, which was a key uh, workload of the system. And is one of the, 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 the features uh, that get fed into ocean mines, machine learning algorithms, uh, one of many that go, um, th those features then get obviously um, scored and turned into uh, actual illegal phishing alerts. Um, and then we're going to talk about lessons learned around benchmarking and optimizing the solutions and why we feel that is actually really so important. So um, I didn't really appreciate the severity of the issue, actually, I must admit, when I first became involved in the project and actually learning, getting to know Ocean Mind, understanding where they're coming from, some of the challenges was really quite eye-opening. I mean, look, the, ultimately, you know, we're in a bad situation. The biodiversity of oceans are you know, at serious risk due to overfishing. And if we look at some of the numbers, um, this first one was really quite surprising to me. Um, Three billion people rely on seafood as a source of protein. Uh, we often don't actually think about the kind of humanitarian, the social impact this really has on people around the world. Who, who rely on seafood as, as a food source. Um, a third of all fish stocks are no longer biologically sustainable. One in every five fish uh, sold is caught illegally, which is nearly $24 billion worth. Um, and also, there's a strong association with illegal fishing and other criminal, criminal activities, such as people trafficking, human slavery, illegal salvage, um, where there's one you know, set of bad people, they're usually doing more than one bad thing. So we were really fortunate uh, last year to work with a company called Ocean Mind. Um, they're actually quite local, so they're based in um, Howell, over sort of down the road a little bit, about 10 miles sort of down the road. Um, their mission is to solve this problem, and they do this by collecting billions of data points um, in, in near real time, uh, applying AI and machine learning uh, to those data points to identify illegal phishing. And they collect the outputs of that and they provide that to law enforcement agencies, to the seafood supply chain as well, so that when people are selling or buying seafood, they know it's coming from a sustainable source. Um, so uh, yeah, really, really, uh, really, really fascinating company. They've got lots of information uh, online. They've been doing lots of talking around their, their technology and the problem specifically. So if this is an area which you're kind of interested in, I, I advise, you know, go and Google them because there's a lot of very good information out there. This is one of their systems. Um, it is, um, it's an old graphic, um, which <laughs> the reason why I say that is because we had a newer graphic of this and I'm, I'm just hoping we've got the right version of the deck. If not, we'll switch it over in a sec. Um, this here actually is, uh, every point here you can see here is a, uh, is a vessel, an ocean vessel, a marine vessel over a certain size and every vessel, machine, uh, marine uh, going vessel over a certain size is required by law to uh, have equipment on board which broadcasts information about where a vessel is at any given point in time, uh, information about that vessel, the size of the vessel, what it's doing, uh, what its purpose is really. Um, and you can see here actually it's really fascinating, you can see the outline of the continents and that's just an outline of where vessels are at any given point in time. Now this, this kind of screen is actually, it's broadcast on a sort of wall about this size actually, the whole length of this wall on lots of screens on a a big version and it's kind of like their NASA style sort of mission control where they can go and then they can literally have a sort of slider and they can rewind and they can see what happened and where vessels have been and gone. They can zoom in, they can go and have a look at a particular area for example, um, see what's going on in that particular area and they do, can do analysis 
uh, at that sort of scale. They also have applications which their analysts use, and they basically they collect all the phishing alerts from their ML algorithms. Uh, they correlate that data with observational data, satellite imagery, and the, and the likes. And they then sort of validate, quantify it, and then forward that information on to authorities, as I mentioned earlier. So the way they do this is they collect, as I mentioned, vessel telemetry. They collect satellite imagery. Uh, they actually sort of hire satellites out um, you know, at, at satellite time. So if there's a particular area of the ocean that they suspect something you know, suspicious is going on, they'll actually go, oh, you know, they'll, they'll rent some satellite time, and they'll take some pictures of the ocean, um, which is quite important. They use radar imagery as well. They take all these data sources and they push them through uh, a set of geospatial models and machine learning models. So it's a, basically, it's a, there's a lot of feature engineering happens up front, geospatial feature engineering. Uh, which takes the raw data, turns them into features that the machine learning algorithms can use to look for specific types of, of, of phishing alerts. And they, are, they do actually go down to you know, the actual individual type of phishing, such as trawling, longline phishing, anything that you can imagine. They can, you know, they can, they can look at the traits uh, to identify you know, very specific, uh, specific types of, machine, uh, of, uh, of phishing alerts. Those alerts then get published um, and they get exposed through APIs and integrations with systems like the one I've just shown you or the analyst systems. And now also uh, for public API consumption. So actually as part of this project, it was a Microsoft funded project uh, as part of the AI for Earth program. Uh, so Microsoft put some money into it. Part of that agreement is that um, OceanMind provide APIs for the community to help get involved. And one of those APIs is an API which allows you to bring your own vessel tracks and all your own data and it will return the phishing alerts um, that, 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 they, that they detect from those, uh, from those vessel tracks. So organizational landscape. They are, what, 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 what I really love about Ocean Mind is um, they're not content just with illegal phishing, okay? They are, they are really driven just to solve any type of environmental humanitarian challenge. And I already mentioned a few of those earlier. And so part of this project was to take, you know, some of their sort of on-premise systems, which was struggling to scale, take it into Azure uh, so that they can use the same technology to scale out, not just in terms of their operations, in terms of more, more real-time kind of workloads, but also to solve some of these new interesting types of challenge, you know, ch challenges around anything to do with vessels, oceans, and data that they can collect. Um, so part of this particular drive, or the immediate drive, was to get more faster real-time alerting. The faster you can detect something's going wrong, the more likely you are going to catch somebody in the act and be able to reprimand them and, 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 and get the law, law enforcement agencies at the right place at the right time. Um, they wanted to use more sophisticated AI, and that was a big driver to go onto Azure in terms of the, 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 the levels of um, uh, models that they could potentially start exploiting was obviously greater, and the, tech, the technology is there uh, that allows them to do a lot more than they could, could have done on-premise. Um, they wanted also to um, extend, expand their, uh, their remit to collaborate with external parties, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so exposing um, algorithms through APIs, sharing information with people so that they can help good causes and everyone hopefully will, will, you know, will benefit as a result. But like any other organization, they've got their constraints. They're a not-for-profit organization, so they're budget constrained. Uh, they have Originally, they were running on-premise, so they had on-premise uh, servers uh, that were sort of glowing white hot, trying to keep up with the data they were trying to process. It was much more of a batch-driven system uh, on-premise, because that's all they could, they could actually do at that point. Um, of course, there was no room to scale. Being an on-premise system, and it literally was an on-premise system, they have servers and, and, and the like running on-premise, they were spending a lot of time tackling fires from infrastructure, servers you know, misbehaving. Um, you know, updating operating systems and the like. And, you know, being a not-for-profit, they've got a small development team. It really is a small uh, development team. So it's about doing, you know, much more with, with quite a small, you know, set of people. Uh, and that was their, their key kind of drivers or drivers and constraints. The obvious decision, I think, you know, we're all, we all know Azure, we wouldn't be here, I don't think, if we, if we if we're aware of the power of the cloud. So I'm not going to sort of go on about that so much, but clearly, they see cloud as being the enabler, key enabler that allows them to get the scale, allows them to get the more sophistication they need going forward and bring, keep the, the business moving in the direction they require it to. If we look at cloud evolution, this is not 
are going to come as a surprise, OK? They want to go from on-premise into the cloud. If we look at the cloud evolution, we see inf you know, infrastructure as a service as a potential offering. We can lift and shift their existing systems as is if we wanted to. We could re-engineer for PaaS or serverless. But clearly, the more we move to serverless, the more potential we've got for reducing the general amount of operational overhead, and hopefully allowing them to innovate more quickly uh, and less time worrying about infrastructure. So that's probably not news to most people. If, they, if it is, um, I can talk forever about why it's not. But I do want to quickly talk a little bit now about what we mean by serverless and what I mean by serverless, because I think serverless is being used as a bit of a marketing term by cloud providers. Um, and it's not really doing justice in terms of what it is, uh, in my opinion. So I prefer the, the term commodity computing when I'm talking about serverless, because it allows us to draw parallels with other types of commodity services we know. So the electricity that flows into our homes is a commodity service. We're used to it. Okay, We've got our laptops plugged in. We charge our phones. We expect to you know, pay our electricity supplier for the amount of energy we consume. Okay? But that's actually, if you think about all the services, all the, you know, even the power services you hear about in, in Azure, that's not actually always the case. In fact, it's probably not, it's, it's, it's the exception really, unfortunately, in terms of all these services. As an example, um, I mean, I, I know uh, in, in my house, I've recently got a, an energy meter, okay? And I'm, getting, I'm, I'm actually got, I was a little bit skeptical actually originally. I was kind of like, I don't really want that. I don't want the energy board to know what I'm doing when I've got my catalog and that sort of thing. But actually, since we've had it, it actually has had the desired effect because I do actually look at it quite religiously. And when I put the kettle on, I can see the numbers literally ticking away. Like, okay. And now I've actually started filling up the kettle, you know, just for one cup rather than the whole lot. And that's because of that. Okay. So I'm really, really conscious. It's really driving a good behaviors, driving down my consumption and I'm saving money, hopefully. Um, so, but if we apply cloud computing to that model, uh, we, we think about, you know, the home, I think it's 10 kilowatt hours on average it, you consume a day. I think it was the last time I looked in terms of the average sort of UK, UK household energy consumption. But if you think about provisioning that, I could say, okay, I'll go to my electricity board and say, okay, well, I'll pay you for 10 kilowatt hours every day. And they give you, okay, there you go. You're getting 10 kilowatt hours. But how that averages out over the day. But if I put my kettle on, that's 2,300 two, two uh, watts um, of energy just in, in that for to boil a kettle. Okay, I'm assuming I'm boiling the whole kettle. Maybe if I'm doing a cup, it would be less. But you know, it's it's it's. But if you actually do the sort of arithmetic, you actually realise that that's a quite a spike. Actually, if you look at the average of 10 kilowatt hours, it actually uh, you know accounts for a spike in terms of the amount of consumption I'm using. And so many cloud services would say, okay, well you've got to provision for that maximum you know, that maximum load. So rather than, you know, provisioning 10 kilowatt hours, I'll be provisioning 46 kilowatt hours, I think it is, I worked out, whatever that may be, which, which would accommodate for the spikes, okay? And then you might turn around to me and say, oh, that's all very well, Jess, but what about, you know, uh, auto scaling, uh, you know, or scaling, should I say, sorry. We'll give you the ability to scale your, 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 your electricity. So I've got, a, you know, a hypothetical little scale, I can slide more on my meter, I can say, okay, I'm gonna scale up, I'm just about to put a kettle on, scale up my LNG, and I can now put my kettle on without it, you know, without it fusing or something. I can boil my kettle and then I can turn it down again. And okay, so I've got some kind of consumption-based model going on, which, okay, but let's face it, we always forget to scale down, um, you know, or we don't realize we've scaled up and we've hit the capacity and either we're not getting the service, the SLAs we require, or we're getting loads of exceptions if you're reading, you know, if you're, if you're trying to hit Cosmos DB, for example, and it just keeps throwing you back and forth four two nines. So that clearly doesn't work particularly well. But then they might say, okay, well, we can auto scale. Rather than you doing it yourself, we can auto scale you. And that's also good, right? So, you know, Cosmos DB has got, now got auto scale, if you didn't know. Uh, also, Pilot's coming out, by the way, if you're interested, which allows you to do some level of auto scale. But that's all very well and good, but um, we'll charge you by the hour. Okay, so I've also, I'm making a cup of tea. It's taking me three minutes for a cup of tea, but I've got to pay for an hour of, of compute at, or electricity at that level. And again, that's nonsense, right? But yet, yeah, this, is, this is how the cloud charges us, okay? It, it seems a little bit strange. So when we talk about cloud consumption or commodity computing, what I'm talking about is genuine consumption-based pricing. So you're paying for what you use when you when you need it, when you want it. The, the energy's there, when you want it, you pay for it. Okay, you can consume as much as you want or as little as you want. Let's look at some cost comparisons to try and sort of drive this home a little bit. We did some analysis of their existing systems. These are yearly or annual costs. Okay. We did some analysis before we started. We looked at lift and shift scenario. Um, you know, if you took all your servers and we put them in the cloud 
and we took, a, you know, we, we took these, these are the years obviously, if we took the growth rate in which we think that you're going to start accumulating data, and that's why it kind of ramps up in terms of why it goes up and it's not linear, uh, because the growth rate's going to grow over time, that by the end of year 10, it's going to be half a million um, for, you know, for a lift and shift, uh, just an operational cost for the VMs. Okay, so, you know, it's quite a bit of money. They're doing quite a lot, to be fair. When we look at Cosmos DB. Now, I'm not having a dig at Cosmos. I love Cosmos. I think it's a great product. But you can see, actually, we start off at year one, actually, it's quite, it's quite manageable, 37K. Uh, by year 10, it's up to a million. Actually, it's over, you know, it's over shot, lift and shift. By the way, lift and shift here is just lifting and shifting. It's not giving them any additional capability. Okay, it's lifting and shifting their existing model. So this isn't, this is batch orientated, you know, in terms of once a, once a day kind of processing. Cosmos DB, the reason why that ramps up a lot more is because we were looking specifically for services that gave us some level of geospatial support because we're doing some geospatial analysis during feature engineering. Cosmos DB SQL API gives you some level of geospatial support, so we looked at that. Cosmos DB SQL supports JSON as a payload. JSON is quite a bloated uh, payload format, uh, therefore you see a much more sort of exaggerated ramp up. And incidentally, when we started this project, uh, I don't know if you've done much Cosmos DB, when we started this project at the beginning of last year, uh, Cosmos DB had this little hidden charge that no one really knew about, okay? And if you had, the more, I can't actually remember what the details are written now, I should have, should have sorted it up before I came on. But um, based on the amount of data you're storing, Cosmos used to uh, enforce that you had a minimum number of RUs. So if you had started building up big data sets, it required that you ran at like 10,000, 50,000, you know, 100,000 RUs, depending on how big your data, as a minimum. They've actually sort of sneakily, they never talked about it, and they sneakily removed that about, I don't know, maybe six months ago, um, which is why these numbers were actually lower than what we originally saw, which were actually even more eye-watering than that. Um, and that's not particularly eye-watering, but they were originally really, really eye-watering. But that's gone away now, so don't worry about that. Um, but what if we could implement the solution using what I would call more, more sort of commodity-based services, or certainly services more on the commodity scale. So things like data lake store, or Azure storage, and Azure Functions. Azure Functions being functions as a service, which some people would argue is genuine serverless, but well, I'm not have this argument there. What would that come out at? Clearly, these two solutions have a lot more smarts. Let's forget about that for a minute because we'll explain how we solve those smarts. But if we just look at the costs, and this is based on actual uh, workload, test workloads we went through. So this is actually after we, we hypothesized, hypothesized that we would actually get significant um, benefits. And as we went through, we started benchmarking what we're doing. Um, data Lake Store, uh, in terms of the data, was coming out from year one about 260 pounds. After year 10, with full data retention, oh, I forgot to mention that actually. Ocean Mind have full data retention. They want hot data all the time. They want that, you know, that big, big, big wall picture of the world. They want to go basically start today and go all the way back 10 years ago if they want to. Okay, so live, hot, hot path data. So five and a half, uh, six and a half grand for storage. Azure Functions uh, starts at 58 pound uh, for the, after the first year, uh, goes up to 290, which is actually nothing, right? It's really nothing. Actually, hopefully when you'll see Carmel talk about actually what we're doing in that workload, you'll realize that it really is absolutely nothing. So on paper, it works out pretty well. Um, incidentally, the £10 a month, if you, take, if you didn't have any data retention, it would cost £10 a month for compute, which is where that comes from. It's actually less than £10 a month, significantly less. So that's where the £10 a month came from. But Ocean One wants to retain loads of data, so it does actually go up, as you would expect. Uh, so the problem we have is how do we fill this gap between geospatial, customized geospatial solution here, something which is very, very cool and has lots of features, that's why you're paying that money, to something which is much more primitive, but if we can exploit it, the benefits are actually quite significant. So, summarize, characteristics we're looking at from a service point of view are zero administration. We don't want to spend any time doing administration or as little as possible. Uh, pricing based on consumption. Transparent scaling from zero. Uh, we have to pay, a, have to, in order to take advantage of that, there is this kind of thing we need to be aware of, which that, that is that naturally there will be limits on resources. Uh, we can't expect absolutely everything, right? These types of environments, certainly the consumption-based environments that you see in clouds, typically have limits in terms of memory, limits in terms of the number of outbound, outgoing connections, those types of things that we have to be aware of, okay? It's just, it's just by definition. Talk a little bit about it in terms of how we manage that as we go through. Um, we want to provision capacity only when it's needed. Uh, 
and we want uh, the option to do containerized hosting. And the reason why I called this out is because lots of people say serverless, Kubernetes, and that's the answer. And it's like, yeah, but we want to take advantage of, of, of Azure native services, not cloud native services, which typically imply you can move between clouds. Uh, Azure native, because Azure native is going to give us the most value in terms of, you know, if we're happy to, to, to bet, our, bet the farm on Azure, then great. But actually now with the likes of Azure Functions, you can run those in containers. So you can actually still have the portability if you wanted to, and if you needed to be able to containerize and put more resources behind it, you could. Incidentally, also, uh, as you're probably or possibly aware with Azure Functions, you do have the provision capacity model as well. So you can actually scale up if you do need the provision and you do need the extra, extra horsepower, and there's no option because you're just doing lots of really powerful stuff. You still have that option. Right, so. Uh, serverless at scale, this is pretty obvious really. When you talk about IoT workloads, you're doing lots and lots of message processing. And we're talking about you know, one and a half billion messages a month that we're processing, vessel telemetry that we're processing. Uh, if we're processing each message, if we can make a small optimization on one of those, over billions of messages, that can accumulate to an awful lot in terms of savings or an awful lot in terms of how much it's gonna cost you. So actually small optimizations or small inefficiencies can have a big impact in IoT-based workloads. And this is very much classed really as an IoT workload. In other sort of types of applications, it may not make sense to optimize it, you know, premature optimization and all that. Um, but certainly in IoT, we're talking about billions of messages, it, it does make a big difference and that's something which we need to be aware of. So let's have a look at pipeline, typical pipeline. Um, we've got external providers. Uh, AIS is the format of the data which we receive. It's that telemetry format uh, that vessels broadcast. Uh, we've got satellite imagery, as I mentioned. That comes in, they're both binary formats. We need to parse that information out into vessel tracks. Uh, vessel tracks just being this vessel was at this point, at this point, this point, this point, so you can sort of see where it's been and gone. That feeds into our geospatial and machine learning models. And then we want to query the output to those model, of those models, the, 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 the phishing alerts and the vessels tracks themselves, and any intermediate features that may be useful for analysis through APIs. That's, that's typically the pipeline. And the challenge is, can we do this with Azure Functions and Azure Data Lake Store? So, how do we go about this? How do we fill this gap between, you know, primitive services, complex problem? So, first thing we do when we're thinking about developing a feature pipeline, by feature, I'm talking about going from raw data, binary data, into some sort of features that can be feed into a, a machine learning model for inference, is that rather than focusing on the data, so lots of people start these projects going, okay, we've got 1.5 billion messages a month, uh, how do we get this into the system? And they just focus on a project just to get data onto the system. We think about it the other way. We think, okay, yeah, we know we're gonna have to get data onto the system. Let's not worry about that just yet. Let's focus in on what the workload is and we'll work backwards, all right? What is the workload we want to do? An important workload, which I've previously mentioned or alluded to, is proximity. I'm not sure you can read that. It says vessels in proximity. And what this means is, uh, can we detect where we've got two vessels in close proximity, either close in space to each other at the same time? Are they, in, you know, are they interacting in some particular, in some way that may be interesting? So that's what we want to do. Can we detect vessels all around the world, globally, every single vessel around the world, Correlating with every other vessel around the world, are they close together and how long have they been in contact for? So that's the workload, well, well defined. It's actually pretty obvious to, to understand from a problem point of view. Um, Carmel will explain how we did this in more detail, but that's the problem. Once we know the problem, we can go and, we can go and run some experiments to say, okay, well, we think we can solve this in various different ways. Um, with Azure Functions, we have the benefit of, well, with Azure Functions, you might say we're actually limited in terms of the amount of functionality we get out of the box. But in some ways, actually, we can play that to our advantage because it's just a runtime for running .NET code, right? And there are loads of libraries out there which do geospatial, and we can just pick and choose whichever ones we want. Um, so actually, it's, it's, it's part of the strength behind this architecture is to give us the ability to say, well, yeah, well, let's see if we can, if we can detect vessels, however, however we want to do that. So once we define the algorithms that, that Define, you know, that, that tell us whether vessels are in, in proximity, we can look at it from a point of view, okay, well, what's the optimal data structure for our real-time processing? How, can we, how do we want our data laid out? That if we just read from top to bottom, we could easily see which vessels are in proximity, right? So that's the next problem we need to solve. 
How do we lay out that data so it's easy to read? Rather than you querying a generic database and saying, select blah, blah, blah from blah, 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 and trying to do all this crazy joins and orders and sorts and everything else. Just lay it out on this. What, what would the ideal format be for every sort of micro batch or batch of data that comes in? What's the ideal format for that data for us to be able to just stream through as quickly as possible, memory as efficient as possible, and, 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 and um, produce the alerts we require? So for example, this says here, it's a bit washed out, but it says vessel coordinates partitioned by time, dot, dot, dot. Basically means exactly what I just said. We could, we could, we could, we could, we could list out all the vessel coordinates partitioned by time by some kind of distancey thing. We'll, Carmel will talk about that in a bit. We can then look at the data source. Where's this data coming from? Well, we know we need vessel telemetry in some format. So we can, we can take the same principle. How do we get telemetry into, into something which can organize that data into the format we require and the layout we require in order to feed this model? Ultimately, of course, it's going to go back to our AIS data provider. Can our AIS data provider provide the data at the frequency we require in order to satisfy our workload requirements, SLA requirements? So that's the approach we take for every type of problem. And if you scale this out, this is what you see. So we've got our vessel in proximity. We've got a bunch of other features. This isn't the only one, there's lots of them. Uh, we have what we call data projections, which are these optimized data structures on, on, you know, that we can quickly just read in, stream in, so that our algorithms generate the required features, and then onto our machine learning algorithms. Um, and we've got a common data source, vessel telemetry, feeding those. Now, this idea here of, of data projections is, is going to be key in terms of how the solution is going to work. Um, and we'll go into that in a bit more detail. What's really interesting about this is you kind of almost like, if you stand away from it, you kind of like, you sort of squint a little bit. You're almost kind of, almost kind of got a kind of, I suppose, a microservices type kind of approach going on. You've kind of got really well-defined autonomous units of work which solve a problem. Uh, they potentially own their own data in terms of they lay out the data however they want it to work. Uh, yes, okay, it's coming from a common data source, but it gives you isolation across each individual uh, feature, which allows you to potentially scale out development, allows you to optimize each feature based on their specific workloads. All the stuff which you get from microservices, you can apply to analytics as well. And so the, pro the approach is very, very similar. Um, so, yeah. What about machine learning? Um, Onyx, the Open Neural Network Exchange, is an open source uh, specification for serializing computation graphs. Why is that important? Because it allows us to train our models and run them in whichever runtime makes sense to our problem. And that may be a serverless runtime. So you've got your usual tools, any tools that you kind of use that can produce an Onyx model. So for example, you could create a TensorFlow model, serialize that out to an Onyx model, and run it in Azure Function, for example, and just do your inference, your scoring within an Azure Function, which is serverless, brilliant. You know, really simple way of, 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 of working. It separates out the two distinct kind of um, problems that you're, you're, you're trying to solve, training, retraining versus inference. If functions doesn't work for you, and it may not, uh, functions don't support GPUs at the moment. So if you require GPUs for, for, for your ML uh, inference, then functions may not work, but for a lot of scenarios it would. You can drop down to something like machine learning service. You can run, run, run on uh, virtual machines. You can run the edge on devices, however you want to. But you can pick and choose. Um, so Onyx is actually really quite a key enabler for kind of serverless um, uh, ML workloads. Before we move on to actually some bit more detail in terms of how it all kind of works, um, I want to talk about the experimental method. So um, in data science, we're really trained to, and for the data scientist in the room, was, this is drilled into you from the ground one, right? Scientific experimental method, which is to define your, um, your success criteria up front, define what is success for you, you with your, along with your hypothesis, run an experiment, prove or disprove your hypothesis. Uh, if, it, if it works, great, move it into production, move on to the next thing. If it doesn't, rethink, try a different set of data, try a different hypothesis. So we try, you know, as data scientists, this is this is second nature to people. As developers doing these types of uncertain types of problems, we didn't know we were going to be able to do this, right? We didn't know that we could run it for ten pounds a month. We had an idea that actually we could get some significant benefits from this. We didn't know, um, you know, the optimum algorithms for, for for running this and and the memory thresholds of Azure Functions, etc. But we can run it as an experiment. As an experiment. So, for example, can we process 1.5 billion messages per month for less than 10 hours compute costs? 
Yes or no? Well, let's define the experiment. Let's run it in, in the simplest possible form you possibly can. Benchmark it and adapt according to everything you see. And it's, that's the number one golden rule for how you actually develop optimized solutions, really. Don't stop making assumptions and just coding to assumptions. Prove it. Uh, I just want to um, show you a quick example of the data. This is um, a kind of like a, a pre a pre pre demo. Um, come, I will explain how this all actually comes into life. But this is uh, Azure Storage Explorer. Azure Storage Explorer um, uh, is used for to, to in this particular scenario just to show what's in our data lake. Presumably, everyone here has some familiarity with. Azure Storage, yeah, in terms of what it is. Uh, Azure Data Lake Store um, is basically just builds on top of Azure Storage. Um, it provides us with a hierarchical namespace so we can um, do more efficient um, uh, analytical workloads on it. Uh, what you can see here are the, uh, the, the file systems that we're using to organize data. Uh, so we've got our, a data file system, that's where most of our data goes into. We've got a raw um, file system, which is where all the raw data goes into, and we separate that out. We use file systems and we use folders as security boundaries um, in order to make sure that we control who has access to what. And that's really important, especially when you're working with data uh, that may be sensitive. Uh, if we have a look at the data, we've got three folders here. Uh, if you've done any kind of pipeline analytics in the past, this kind of probably looks sort of familiar. We've got a parsed folder. This parsed folder contains, um, if I drill into it, it's going to let me, um, contains data which has been parsed from raw format, from our raw binary format. Parse folder contains, yeah, okay. So parse folder contains uh, the, um, the, the, the data which has been parsed from raw format into a format which we can use for analytical purposes. You, it doesn't really make sense to parse each file again every time you're doing some analysis. If we can turn that into a format that we can query more, uh, more reliably or easily, then, we, then, then that would be better. We standardized on Parquet which, as the file format. Um, if you want to learn more about that, grab us afterwards. But it, it has some benefits in terms of how it lays out data on disk in terms of compression and everything else, which is the reason why we chose it in this particular example. So we had parsed. We had uh, our projections folder, which is where we took the parsed data and we projected it into representations which were optimized for, an, for our analytics. And then we had, which if I show you, if we were connected to the internet, I'll show you there's a signals folder. Which, uh, which is where all our alerts went to. They, these are the signals which our analysts use, including phishing alerts themselves. So we kind of have this kind of standard um, kind of approach. Now, what I, wanted to what I wanted to show you was that all that data is empty. So if we actually went and ran this in a moment, you'll see it populate. So it's more like I just to show you there's no smoke and mirrors. We may have to run the video of it. So Jess talked a lot about sort of the uh, approach that we took. Um, so I'm going to try and talk a bit more about uh, concrete what we did. Um, so. What do we need to do to build up this, this processing pipeline we're talking about? So the one I'm going to focus on is the proximity analysis. So Jess spoke about this a bit, but basically proximity means, uh, the proximity analysis means finding ships which are within a certain distance of each other for a certain amount of time. And um, it's important because this is one of the factors that OceanMind fed into their machine learning models uh, to, in order to um, detect illegal fishing. So this involved identifying these ships in close proximity using their vessel point data. So Ships have to check in uh, by law, I think it's about every five minutes. Um, and so you get all this vessel point data and from that you can build up these vessel tracks and then you can analyze these tracks by comparing them to one another to find uh, events where two ships are within a certain distance and then for, therefore uh, feed these events into the machine learning. Um, but because we decided to take this sort of serverless approach, so we decided against this out of the box, like so um, we could have moved their existing systems onto um, Azure and then used uh, the um, geospatial engines they were already using in order to do this analysis. But we were trying to do this in a more serverless, sort of like build up the exact processing we needed. So we had to do this ourselves. So that involved taking, so if you had one ship and you had two consecutive vessel points in the track and you had um, so you took the start and end point of that little segment of vessel track and used the average velocity between those two points to work out equations for the position of that vessel in both the x and the y direction. It's actually all latitude and longitude, but because of the scales we were working out, we could approximate that this was all sort of planar. We could then use uh, these equations to work out um, an equation for the distance between two vessels at any given time. So, you know, just by Pythagoras, the square of the distance between these two vessels is just the square of the difference in their position in either of these directions. 
So once we had that, we could work out the two times at which um, the vessels went within, that set, uh, within a contact distance of one another and when they left that distance and therefore raise events based on how long they spent within that proximity. So um, the issue with this sort of analysis we had to do was that comparing all 200,000 vessels in the ocean to every other vessel, each of these vessels checked in about every two minutes. So that was like 300 million comparisons a second. So we needed a way of reducing the amount of ships we needed to compare. Um, so we had to like, we had to find a way to quickly identify candidates for this proximity analysis. So we were sort of looking around a way to do this and we were sort of researching geospatial algorithms. And while we were doing this, we came across a paper about R trees. So R trees are a way of sort of storing and indexing spatial data. Um, so the way we did it was we took, so I was talking about these segments of vessel tracks. So for each of those little track segments, we found the bounding box um, and we stored those bounding boxes in a structure like the one shown here. We could then sort of focus in on different parts of this artery um, in order to find uh, bounding boxes which were overlapping and therefore segments of track that were sort of likely to be within a certain distance of one another and therefore candidates for this proximity analysis. <coughs> Um, this meant that we could really, really reduce the amount of data that we had to compare and really reduce the amount of processing we had to do and therefore the cost of running this. Um, so, but what we wanted to do is be able to really quickly and efficiently build up these R trees. So in order to do that, we wanted to store the data in a certain way, which would make it easy to just basically read the data out straight into this R tree. Um, and the way that made sense to do that was to store the data so that you could basically read out the track for each vessel, just like one after another. So in practice, what that meant was that when new data arrived, we like um, partitioned this up into different time boxes. And this meant that you could sort of just compare each um, of the tracks to other ones within that time box, and therefore ones that are only like, you know, with us within a certain time window of one another. Um, and then for each of those files, you end up sorting the data first by vessel ID, and then for each vessel sorting by timestamp. So like, in this really simple example, um, we've got the first half of the file will be the track for vessel one, and the second half will be the track for vessel two. Um, this meant that we could read the data straight out of these vessel tracks and into this R tree representation, and then for like get that done really quickly and carry on with the rest of the processing. Um, so just to show you like what that actually looks like in practice is you. So this is um, we use Parquet as just mentioned, which is like a um, really uh, compactable file format. Um, this is shown using uh, Databricks, I don't know. Um, but like uh, Databricks is really great for like exploratory analysis. So it's really good for just going, oh, what does my data look like? And that, um, so I've just used it here to show this Parquet file because Parquet is a bit of a nightmare to actually visualize. So, um, <laughs> but yeah, so we can see here we've got, so this is an ID of a vessel. So we've got the first half of this file is the track for vessel one. Uh, and the second half is the track for vessel two. And we've got a timestamp, so um, then latitude and longitude. Um, and some, yeah, another ID and some course of grounds, some other data, uh, which uh, talking about the vessel track. So, um, so yeah. And the great thing about this is, so this was this was the representation of the data that was useful for the analysis we wanted to do, so to the build up these R trees. But if we wanted to do a different sort of analysis, we could just project the, vessel, the data into a different format um, in order to support that other sort of analysis we needed to run. Um, and this is all possible because uh, Azure Data Lake is a really cheap storage um, option. And so extra like production of the data is sort of for minimal cost. And this is basically multi-indexing the data, but not paying that premium price for multi-index storage. So yeah, so we've got this, this multi-stage processing. We've got data arriving. We ingest it in its binary format. We then pass the data into this um, Parquet file format. Um, and then we run the processing in order to then be the geospatial processing we mentioned and then in order to feed the ML algorithms and then finally query those results in order to carry on with the analysis. So it's quite a lot of stages in processing and we needed some way to sort of orchestrate this and uh, that's where durable functions came in. So some of you might already know um, that Azure Oxford, but a durable functions extension of Azure functions which are used to sort of build up long-running uh, stateful processing. So in order to do this, you have um, sort of multi-stage processing, and each stage in the process is, to, is calling out to a different um, async operation. And um, as you go through the processing, you store state, because um, you need to be able to restart the processing. Because these are long-running operations, if the host restarts, you need to be able to restart from where you left off. Um, and therefore, so you store state as you go along. Um, 
I've said, yeah, so you um, build up the process and using these async operations. And you can also control the parallelization within the system. So um, if you've got processing that can happen in parallel, you can fan out and um, sort of more functions and sentences can be um, it can be started up as you um, fan out, and then as you, um, if you need to aggregate those results and do the analysis over these sort of collection of results, you can fan back in and do that. So yeah, there's a few different um, patterns used in in building up this sort of long-running orchestration. Um, so function chaining is, if you've got um, these multiple steps you need to carry out, function chaining means to take the output of one step and use that to feed the um, execution of the next. So this is how you build up your sort of multi-stage processing. If you, can if you can split up your processing into multiple little stages, you can then orchestrate these using func function chaining to build up like quite co complex processing. Um, Durable Functions also has inbuilt support for the async HTTP API <laughs> pattern. Um, so that, that pattern is basically if you kick off a long running operation via an HTTP call, um, you will then be returned a redirect link, which, will, which you can then use to pull for the state of the operation. Um, and Durable Functions is really good because it integrates really well with Azure Data Factory because Azure Data Factory will automatically pull that endpoint for completion. So then like, once the um, Durable Function is completed, you can then carry on with any more processing that you're sort of building around that orchestration. And I've already mentioned the fan in, fan out pattern. So that is, yeah, for controlling the parallelization within the system, meaning that you can really speed up the processing if there's bits that can happen at the same time. You don't need to then run those all in series. So yeah, in practice, what this looked like. So our new data arrived, it was passed. Um, we could then project out. So in so the projection I was just talking about where you have the vessel tracks, um, you can then, if you had another projection you want to do, you could do those in parallel because those two projections would be completely independent. And then for each projection, you know, I had the sort of um, different partition files. Each of those partition files are then, again, completely independent. So we can then run those in parallel. And then if you sort of need uh, then to aggregate those results and say, OK, overall, what proximity events do we have? You can then fan back in and analyze those events and then finally query the insight at the other end. So this is where we go to the live demo. <laughs> um, I actually might. So <laughs> I didn't manage to run this live demo last time either, because last time I clicked on and went, oh, well, live demo, what could go wrong? Clicked on to Postman, <laughs> not responding, would not wake back up. I literally clicked on one thing. Anyway, I think I'm going to run the video this time as well, just because um, the internet in this basement is not incredibly fast. And so usually this all runs up in Azure. Um, but here we will have to, because I'm running it locally, have to download the data and re-upload it. So it's going to take a while. Right, so here we've got um, running locally a durable function. Um, so usually this whole thing would be kicked off um, when a new file arrives into the system. This would then kick off this durable function. So you have the function input, and that is just sent into here. Here I'm just running it through Postman. But so we start. We can see it's projecting the vessels for this particular file, and hopefully. So here you can see on the right that it started to read in the data for that file. So you can see the memory spike increase, and this this tool was actually really good as we were running this because we could see sometimes that the memory spike just like went off the charts and there's like, OK, there's obviously something going on here. And we have these functions sort of like limits in memory that we needed to uh, be aware of. So very useful tool if you haven't used it before. But yeah, so we can see here that we're running each of the projection, the, each of these partitions in. What's going on there? <laughs> you think, uh, I videoed this, so I wouldn't have a. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> you can see that each of these are actually having in series because we need throughout these um, partitions, we need like a continuous track. Um, so what happens here is so you'll have this uh, partition file and you get all the points in that file. And then because you need this continuous track, if we just analyzed each file completely independently, then you wouldn't have a continuous track through all of them. So we take the final points from this file and we add them to the next one so that when we do analysis over all the files, you get a sort of continuous view of the tracks throughout. Um, and you can see here there's quite, <laughs> quite a lot going on. But once, so once all of these have been processed, we can then start doing the proximity analysis, so building up those R trees and then running that sort of more um, in-depth proximity analysis over those. And this is all happening in parallel. So this is fanned out. Um, and if you're running the cloud, you get multiple func function instances doing this. So you see it's quite noisy because all of this stuff is happening at the same time. But <laughs> hopefully somewhere in this processing, you might be able to see building an R tree. I mean, uh, I currently can't see one. But I'm, uh, they're in there, I swear. <laughs> But yeah, so you get all this processing happening, and it all happens in parallel. And then once all of that is done, we can then fan back in and run the sort of 
in depth as, that we then out the other side get these proximity events and can then feed these into the machine learning algorithms. So hopefully, <laughs> this will finish soon. Um, and we so in the demo that Jess nearly did earlier, if the internet had been working, um, you, we would have seen that the files here were empty. They are now no longer empty. Um, and we've got projection files, so this will be for this time. And um, we've got a uh, file, uh, a data taxonomy here that allows us to sort of drill into different um, time periods. But yeah, so we've got, uh, we had projections and we've now got signals for each of those time periods and then can use those for further analysis. Yeah, so we've built up this um, processing pipeline and we've got all this in place. And we now need to sort of optimize and benchmark, uh, so optimize for a serverless environment. And to do that, we needed to benchmark the system. So we needed to be able to check that any change we made was actually an improvement in either cost or performance. And so what I mean for optimizing a serverless environment is, as Jess was mentioning, the um, there are certain constraints in Azure Functions, so there's constraints on memory, and we needed to make sure we were staying within those memory constraints. And also that the pricing is based on both um, execution time and memory consumption. So the less time we took and the less memory used within that time, the cheaper it was going to be. Uh, yeah, so we wanted to be able to make sure that anything we did was actually an improvement. And we wanted to build this benchmarking into the into our change man management within the system. So we bought, built a small tool which was based off of um, Azure, in Azure Application Insights, um, which basically uh, monitored the processing up in Azure and spat out sort of uh, function execution units, which are um, the cost basically um, for what's running, and a lot of other metrics. And this meant that we could then, using this, sort of um, assess any change we made. Um, so in order to be able to um, optimize in this way, we needed to understand what factors affect performance in .NET. Um, and we're focusing on .NET here because we were building a system using .NET, but Azure Functions, you can use JavaScript, uh, Java, uh, F Sharp. So basically, there's a lot of options. And like this, um, optimizing for a serverless environment, these principles all apply to any language you're using. Going to focus on .NET. So the first factor is obviously the processing logic. If you're doing loads of unnecessary work, clearly it's going to take longer than it needs to. But something that people often overlook is the effect of garbage collection. So uh, garbage collection is the process in .NET of clearing up unused memory. Um, so the way that works is it suspends all processing in order to be able to count the references which are still in use. Um, so obviously, the more garbage collections that are triggered, the less time that will actually be spent on the processing you want to do. So if we could reduce the number of garbage collections, we could really speed up our processing. Um, so in order to do that, we wanted to cause as few allocations as possible. Um, and also, alongside the, um, the fact that this is going to improve performance because of the garbage collector, this is also going to reduce the amount of memory we're using and therefore the cost of the system as a whole. So we used a few different techniques for this. Um, the first one I want to talk about is list preallocation. So um, lists in C Sharp are based off of arrays, and arrays are a fixed size when you initialize them. Who knows? Um, and lists sort of abstract over that in that you can just keep adding items to a list, but under the covers they are built on arrays. So if you um, don't give a list a capacity when you initialize it, it um, defaults to four. Um, <laughs> and so the list you can continue adding to it, but the underlying array is a size of four. And so if you then go over that capacity by adding four more items, it will allocate a new array of size eight. Um, so then the old array is then discarded and needs to be cleaned up by the garbage collector. So this causes a lot of extra work for the garbage collector. And it gets especially bad when you have really, really big lists. <laughs> Because so you've got this massive list of items, and we had quite large lists of items with all of our vessel points. And uh, if you go over the, si the capacity of that list, you suddenly get a list allocated of double that size, and you get these massive spikes in memory. Um, and we, run into, we ran into this when trying to run these functions. We'd suddenly run out of memory. It, like <laughs> Memory would spike, completely run out of memory. Everything would die. Um, so the way to get around this is to um, Give the list a capacity, uh, give initialize the list with a specified capacity of whatever size you need, and this will then um, eliminate the problem of these massive memory spikes and reduce the amount of memory you're using normally. Because when these big memory spikes happen, you've got a load of memory you're using which is unnecessary. 
the next technique we use is actually to not use lists at all. <laughs> and so we used our enumerable, so using like stream processing, so that we never had to store this entire list in memory. This only worked because all the processing we needed to do, we could kind of aggregate as we went. So we didn't actually need to do any whole list operations. We didn't need to store the whole list in memory at any given time. But that meant that we could massively reduce the memory we were using at any moment um, because we weren't storing it all at one time. Um, and therefore, we're way, way, way less likely to run into these out of memory exceptions in the first place. Uh, another important thing to consider is uh, the arguments between reference and value types. So um, if you use a class in C Sharp, it's a reference type, um, you get this, a, a thing class, will use uh, 20 bytes of memory. So this is the, four, the eight bytes for the um, actual data. Um, then you get a four byte pointer to that data, um, and then eight bytes for the object header that um, objects on the heap have. Um, this is a 32-bit process. Um, you then, if you instead use a struct, which is a value type, this is um, this, the memory for that, the, the data is stored actually you know, by the object itself, and you don't get that overhead, and it will just use eight bytes. So this is where benchmarking came in really important, because uh, I went, okay, I'm trying to reduce the memory. I've got a massive list of uh, vessel, um, vessel data points. I, uh, structs are smaller than reference types, so I'm just going to switch them all over. I ended up making things a lot worse, <laughs> because the issue is, so if you start having multiple copies of an object, so with a um, reference type, each additional copy will just store another reference to that same bit of data on the heap. So each additional object of a class will just store an extra four bytes of data. With a struct, every additional copy gets its own copy of the data and therefore uses an extra eight bytes. And you can see that as you start to get more copies of an object, a struct will eventually use more data than a class. And we had lots of copies of the same object because we were um, comparing uh, pairs of vessel track segments. So you ended up with a big list of uh, pairs of vessel track segments and then <laughs> you end up using a lot more memory, as it turns out, when you make the switch. So yeah, it was a really important use of the benchmarking tool because we could see instantly <laughs> that things were not good, that I had not done the right thing, basically. Um, the last technique I wanted to talk about was um, is a relatively new addition to C Sharp, is a span of T. So spans are a way of indexing into like contiguous memory on the heap. So um, this is a... Um, example from Ian Griffiths, who's the guy presenting in next month, is it? Um, this is his new book on C Sharp 8, and uh, it's a, an example for that, which I have stolen. I did ask him. Um, <laughs> so, so you had a string that was um, represented URL. Um, so if you initialize a new URI object, you can um, access different parts of that string using the properties on that URI. And uh, the issue is that each of these properties equates to another string which has been allocated on the heap. So you end up with a lot of extra allocations from just sort of initializing this object which you can then index into the different properties. If you instead use a span um, to just index into the first four characters, which are you know, it's the scheme, um, you, because spans are um, reference structs, they actually are allocated on the stack, so you don't end up using extra, any extra memory on the heap in order to do the processing like this. So obviously, processing like this, you get a lot. There's a lot of um, extra complication. Um, it can be a, like a, a headache to do processing like this. But in this case of um, uh, serverless processing, especially with big data, as Jess was saying, like these really tiny annotations can have a massive impact. On, like if you're doing this over and over again, um, so processing like this can be like integral to getting a solution which is cost effective and also highly performant. Um, yeah, so, so we use these techniques and in doing all of this, massively reduced the amount of memory we're using, massively improved the performance of the system and ended up with something that was costing, as Jess showed, uh, less than 10 pounds a month. So I just want to quickly go through, uh, summarize some of the takeaways um, before we finish up. Um, so commodity cloud services um, have really helped Ocean Mind to process more data in near real time, um, and ultimately reducing the operational over, the operational overhead. Um, the constraints that we that Carmel mentioned in terms of memory, um, they need to be managed through experimentation and benchmarking. Um, we always knew that our goal was to use consumption-based 
consumption plans for functions. We always knew we could always go up to the premium tiers if we want to, and we still can if we want to. Um, but ultimately, as long as you go through a process, methodical process is actually quite, you know, it's quite quick to actually just iterate over, measure what um, your change has made in terms of um, overall impact to the workload. And um, you should be good to bake that into your development processes is the message. Um, cheap cloud storage can be a good alternative to generic analytical databases if you treat, treat it in the right way. Um, the projection approach works really well for this project. We found it works really well for a lot of things. Um, sometimes databases obviously have their place and I'm not saying get away from them completely, but you know, consider whether your workloads would actually map quite nicely just to simple cloud storage. Um, that requires the data protection architecture that Carmel explained uh, earlier. This is us, um, by all means, you know, connect if you want to talk about any of this any further. We'll be hanging around afterwards as well for a short time. This is a link to Ian's book, plug. So it's literally just only just been released. Uh, recommend you look at it. It's got all the latest C-sharp uh, eight features um, and a lot of things that come out mentioned in more detail. Okay, a couple of references for you. Uh, we benchmarked and tried to use uh, a, you know, a, a number of AIS parsers that were out there, open source AIS parsers. We found that performance wise, they weren't brilliant. Um, so we wrote our own. Um, it supports, it doesn't support the full set of message types that you get from AIS, but it supports a good set of them. This particular um, parser can process eight, uh, seven million uh, AIS uh, records per second on a single core. So it's pretty fast, you can scale that out obviously. So um, if you're doing any AIS processing, you want to contribute, please get involved, just raise PR. Or if you're just interested in some of the techniques that Carmel mentioned, especially things around span of T, that's used extensively in that to keep keep garbage, garbage collection down. Um, Carmel's done a lot of blogging around this subject, so uh, if you want to have a sort of a more of a deep dive into some of the things she's been talking about, there's a few of Carmel's blogs. Um, the R tree paper, um, there's an R tree paper here. Um, it's part of the RX Spatial uh, library as well, if you want to have a look at that, and there's, um, there's follow the links to, to know more about R trees. Uh, Microsoft have done some case studies with OceanMind that are on YouTube. So please, uh, if you're interested in Ocean Mind, uh, you know, I recommend you, you know, get to know them. They're a really friendly bunch. Um, have a look at some of the Microsoft case studies online. Finally, um, we've put together, if you're interested in Wardley mapping, uh, Wardley mapping is a really interesting um, technique for uh, coming up with strategy around uh, what technologies make sense to adopt, where to focus your effort for your your particular business, when to use commodity services versus building your own. If you've done any Wardley mapping, um, I thoroughly recommend you have a look at this link. If you haven't done any Wardley mapping, you've heard about it, and you want to learn some more, I recommend you look at that link. And I recommend you look at that link anyway because you'll learn some really good stuff. Um, it's a video online. Um, please have a look at it. It's, it's really good. 